Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Monty Hart Lecture Series. It's a great pleasure to have today uh, Professor Luigi Badano, who will be speaking about the tricuspid valve assessment uh, by imaging. Dr. Badano currently serves both as full professor of cardiovascular medicine at the University of Milano in, in Italy and as a director of the Integrated Cardiovascular Diagnosis Unit at the Instituto Axiologico Italiano in Milan as well. Professor Badano has over 330 peer reviewed publications, uh, authored nine books about echocardiography and cardiovascular imaging. Dr. Badano has also been listed among the highly cited researchers from 2018 to 2021 by Clarivariate, a very recognized uh, institution that ranks researchers. He, is the, he has served as the president of the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging from 2010 to 2012. He's an associate editor for JACE, European Heart Journal of Heart Failure, Echocardiography, and Frontiers Cardiovascular Imaging, and also in many editorial boards in, in very famous journals such as Circulation Cardiovascular Imaging, Jack Imaging, European Journal of Echocardiography, and Cardiovascular Imaging. He's an honorary member of the Hungarian, Romanian, and Korean Societies of Cardiology, and a fellow of the American Society of Echocardiography, British Society of Echo, and the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging. In 2013, he was awarded as the Silver Medal of the European Society of Cardiology for his clinical and research activities and his commitment as a president of the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging. It's a great honor to have you here. We follow your research and, and, and enjoy reading your papers a lot. So very excited for your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bustamante. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, for uh, this uh, invitation. It's uh, really a pleasure and an honor to uh, share uh, with uh, you and uh, the colleagues in, in New York uh, um, the results uh, of uh, what uh, we have done uh, about uh, the tricuspid uh, uh, valve uh, over the last uh, 10 years, I would say. So, uh, uh, I, uh, when uh, thinking at uh, how to organize uh, this uh, lecture, I, uh, in the end, uh, decided to go just uh, as uh, we approach the patients uh, with the tricuspid regurgitation when uh, they enter in the, the echo lab. So during uh, my presentation, uh, I will uh, um, uh, go through the workflow that we have that starts in the defining uh, the morphology of the valve, identify the etiology of the tricuspid regurgitation, assess the severity of uh, the regurgitation and uh, grade it, and uh, in the end to evaluate the hemodynamic and functional impact um, of uh, the tricuspid regurgitation on the upstream and downstream cardiac chambers, uh, namely the right uh, ventricle and uh, the right atrium. One uh, uh, important uh, um, technological advancement that changed completely our approach to the tricuspid valve was the introduction of uh, three-dimensional echocardiography. And um, as uh, you know, uh, differently from the vital valve, the tricuspid valve uh, has a tree leaflet. And uh, it is uh, very uh, occasionally that, that we can uh, see all the tree leaflet in a single uh, um, echo um, two-dimensional view. And it is occurring a, a really in a minority of the patients. And even when uh, you can uh, successfully uh, see all the tree leaflet, what uh, you actually see is just the border of the leaflet. So these um, tree uh, white, line that are dancing into the dark of the left atrium or the left uh, or the right ventricle. With the three-dimensional echocardiography and a particularly transthoracic uh, three-dimensional echocardiography, uh, because um, uh, the tricuspid valve is uh, located anteriorly into the mediastinum, 
uh, the valve is much better is much better seen using the transthoracic than the, the transesophageal approach. And here, as you can see in uh, this uh, 3D data set uh, taken transthoracically and uh, uh, oriented, uh, uh, looking at the valve from the ventricular perspective, here uh, you have uh, the uh, mitral valve, the interventricular septum, and here you have the three leaflet of the tricuspid valve, taking the interventricular septum as uh, an anatomical reference. Here you have uh, the septal leaflet, here is the right ventricular outflow tract. Here should be the pulmonary valve. And so this one is the anterior leaflet. And then this is the posterior or the mural leaflet. And this type of images can be acquired around 85% of the patients providing a detailed anatomical assessment of the valve. Um, since uh, we have the, such good images, uh, um, we became firstly interested into the uh, anatomical variability of uh, the tricuspid valve leaflets, uh, either in uh, their number uh, or uh, the morphology. And uh, we realized that indeed, the uh, classical uh, three leaflet uh, morphology of the tricuspid valve that you can see in the center of these uh, images is in um, the majority of the patients, but uh, there is a sizable number of uh, patients uh, that uh, show just the two leaflet, one the septal and one large mural leaflet, or have an um, additional number of scallops of leaflets. Here you see four, but um, in uh, some anatomical tests, uh, has been described up to five or six um, uh, identifiable scallops of the tricuspid valve. And in this, uh, this uh, morphological uh, um, uh, um, variety of the tricuspid valve that has implication in uh, the transcatheter uh, um, uh, procedures uh, has been uh, standardized uh, by a, a couple of years ago in this paper by Becky Han and uh, co-workers that uh, identified uh, the typical tricuspid uh, um, leaflet uh, morphology in, in blue in um, just uh, half of the patients. And uh, then uh, there is a variety of uh, morphologies uh, and uh, among them, the, uh, most, um, uh, the, the most prevalent is uh, the type 2B where the posterior leaflet is split in two and you have a single anterior and the septal leaflet. But then as you see, you can have a, a large variability in uh, the uh, morphology. Three-dimensional echocardiography is not just to look at the morphology of the valve, even if it is really important, but with three-dimensional echocardiography, for the first time, we had the opportunity to make a quantitation of the volumes and ejection fraction of the right ventricle without any um, geometrical assumption on uh, this uh, quite uh, complex uh, uh, geometry chamber, we can uh, assess uh, by three-dimensional echocardiography the right atrium. And uh, finally, we can uh, quantitate uh, the uh, size and uh, the shape of uh, the tricuspid annulus. Being able uh, to assess all the components or what uh, I would uh, call uh, the tricuspid uh, valve apparatus, uh, we made uh, um, a great advancement in uh, the understanding the pathophysiology of uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation, particularly of a functional tricuspid regurgitation. So uh, after having uh, uh, assessed the, the morphology of the valve, uh, the second step is to identify the uh, etiology of the, the tricuspid regurgitation. And uh, here, uh, something that we have learned uh, that um, uh, tricuspid regurgitation can originate uh, 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 secondary tricuspid regurgitation can originate from the uh, remodeling of the right uh, ventricle, 
with the, the dilation of the, the right uh, ventricle and the dysfunction. And in this case, uh, the uh, right ventricle assumes uh, a uh, more ovoidal shape with the increase not only of the basal diameter, but also of uh, the mid diameter. In this case, uh, we have uh, the horizontalization and the retraction of the papillary muscles uh, with uh, the tethering of the leaflets. And so when uh, we look at uh, the valve, we have not only the enlargement of uh, the annulus, but also a huge tenting uh, uh, of the valve. And um, this is uh, typically um, the typical uh, mechanism of tricuspid regurgitation secondary to pulmonary hypertension, um, cardiomyopathies affecting the right ventricle, or um, uh, post-capillary pulmonary hypertension uh, following uh, diseases of the left heart. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have also a secondary tricuspid regurgitation in patients with the normal or nearly normal right ventricle that have an, an enlarged basal diameter, but the mid diameter is normal and the right ventricle preserves this triangular shape when looked on, uh, in, on the front as the normal. And here the tricuspid regurgitation is mainly due to the uh, dilation of the right atrium that uh, uh, is uh, uh, key to explain the dilation of the tricuspid annulus. In those patients, we have a large dilation of the tricuspid annulus, but uh, uh, very uh, small or no tenting. And it, this is uh, the uh, secondary tricuspid regurgitation that occurs in patients uh, with the history of atrial fibrillation or in patients uh, with uh, heart failure with preserved uh, ejection fraction and uh, um, uh, atrial cardiomyopathy. This has been shown by Diana Florescu and uh, the researchers in our lab that identified uh, the peculiar shape of the right ventricle and of the right atrium that uh, um, um, separates the patients with the, the atrial from the patients with the, the ventricular phenotype of uh, secondary tricuspid regurgitation when we have uh, an increase of the medium diameter of the right ventricle and a an, uh, huge tenting of the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid annulus, it's uh, uh, one of the, the key uh, structure of the tricuspid valve apparatus to understand uh, the etiology of the tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, we have learned from uh, the uh, anatomy that uh, the tricuspid annulus is not circular, is a saddle-shaped uh, um, uh, geometry um, like uh, the mitral counterpart particularly um, a little bit more D-shaped in a cross sec section. But uh, what is important is that uh, the tricuspid annulus has a very small fibrous part that is uh, the, um, the, on the portion, uh, the only the portion uh, uh, to which it attached the, the septal leaflet uh, of the valve. All the rest of the valve is a virtual annulus, uh, particularly made uh, by uh, fat, uh, some uh, fibrous um, uh, uh, cells uh, and uh, a little amount of uh, uh, um, muscular and myocytes. And um, another important point, uh, looking at uh, the geometry of the tricuspid annulus, that uh, it's uh, so complex that there is no single uh, linear dimension that, that can account for its aqua actual size. And so no diameter taken in any of uh, the two-dimensional views can uh, be really a parameter that uh, reflects uh, the uh, actual size of the tricuspid annulus. This is just an example. These uh, two um, RV focused um, apical views, the one uh, on the left and the one on the right, are very similar and they are taken from the same 3D data set that you can see here on the top. What we have done is just to change the uh, transversal line, the yellow line, by 10 degrees. 
So there is uh, no uh, visible change uh, in uh, the orientation of the view, but uh, as uh, you see, if you take the measurement with just this small change in the orientation of your probe, the diameter of the anus changes for uh, 0.5 centimeters. That uh, is a five uh, millimeter change. That it's a, a huge, and it is uh, just uh, due to the uh, complex geometry and uh, the small rotation of uh, the uh, probe. So um, if you wanted to assess uh, the tricuspid annulus, uh, you need, uh, uh, again, a three-dimensional echocardiography. Once again, a transthoracic approach is uh, very um, uh, useful and uh, highly feasible. And now we also have uh, specific uh, software packages that in a few clicks uh, will uh, provide uh, you the, both the shape and uh, all the quantitative uh, data that you need uh, to describe the geometry, the size of the tricuspid annulus, and also the extent of the tenting of the leaflets. Recently, Denise Amoraro from uh, our uh, lab has uh, uh, published uh, the reference values obtained from uh, uh, 227 healthy volunteers in order to be able to distinguish between normal and, uh, and enlarged tricuspid annulus. We have found that there is a difference in men um, from women, even if you um, index the size for the body surface area, while there is no change with age. So uh, we have just to take into account of the body size of our patients and the sex. Another important uh, um, contribution of three-dimensional echocardiography in understanding uh, the etiology of the tricuspid regurgitation uh, uh, was uh, the um, uh, being more aware than in the past that the presence of uh, electronic wires, electrocatheters, can interfere in the motion of the tricuspid valve. And so this um, tricuspid regurgitation due to the uh, pacemaker or uh, ICD or CRT lead interference that was uh, hardly diagnosed with the conventional two-dimensional echocardiographies, these two prevalences come from the the studies uh, performed at the Mayo Clinic, you see that uh, the correct diagnosis was uh, uh, done in less than um, <clears throat> one out of five of the patients with tricuspid regurgitation. Now with the three-dimensional echocardiography, we can identify exactly the position of uh, the wire and identify if this is interfering with the, the motion of the leaflets. So the correct diagnosis with the transthoracic three-dimensional echocardiography can be reached in more than 90% of the patients. So when you have a patient with uh, um, electronic wires uh, due to pacemaker, ICD, or a CRT, and severe tricuspid regurgitation, you can uh, um, uh, obtain a three-dimensional data set of uh, the uh, tricuspid valve and see, like in this case, uh, this uh, catheter that is almost blocking uh, the motion of the posterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve, leaving a, a huge um, regurgitant orifice that is responsible of uh, uh, the uh, disease. And, uh, um, but uh, not, of course, uh, not all uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation are due to the interference uh, with uh, the electronic wires, even if they are. So it's important that in each patient uh, with uh, the concomitant of uh, significant tricuspid regurgitation and the presence of pacemaker, ICD or CRT to obtain these three data set, you can have uh, uh, patients uh, with um, an uh, um, innocent uh, um, position of the pacemaker when he, he's, uh, it is in the center of uh, the orifice and not interfering at all, or most, uh, that is most of the cases when it is placed in one of the commissure, particularly the commissure between uh, the posterior leaflet and uh, the septal leaflet, and uh, these are innocent uh, uh, presence of uh, the uh, pacemaker. Compared to these uh, two cases, uh, in this one, uh, you see uh, clearly the pacemaker wire that is interfering 
with the, the motion of the inter the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, or and it is uh, one of the most frequent cases. The uh, clear not only interference but also fibrous adherence of uh, the uh, pacemaker wire with the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. So um, all of this uh, um, body, uh, the, this body of notion that we gather with the two-dimensional echocardiography uh, allowed us to change the uh, classification of secondary tricuspid regurgitation that now is not anymore just uh, secondary tricuspid regurgitation, but uh, we uh, distinguish an atrial and ventricular phenotype. And we will see in a moment why it is important to distinguish between the two. Then we have the organic of primary tricuspid regurgitation when uh, there is a disease with a change of uh, the morphology of uh, the leaflets. And uh, finally, the uh, CAD-related uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And uh, this is uh, um, the, uh, also the classification that has recently uh, been published on the, by the TWARC consortium uh, in order to um, harmonize the classification of uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation. It's important to distinguish between the ventricle and the atrial phenotype uh, because they have also a different clinical outcome. And usually the outcome of the atrial phenotype is more benign than the ventricular one, uh, particularly if we, we look at uh, the composite and the point of death and the heart failure hospitalization. Uh, these are recent data uh, published by Mara Gavazzoni from our our lab showing that uh, the atrial uh, phenotype in blue has a, a better um, medium term outcome than the ventricular. And it is interesting that looking at the determinants or the uh, parameters associated with the tricuspid regurgitation that are the main determinants of outcome in um, the ventricular phenotype, it's uh, um, the severity of tricuspid regurgitation is an independent predictor of outcome, but also uh, the parameters describing the right ventricular function are uh, independent uh, uh, determinant of uh, the outcome. Uh, conversely, in uh, the atrial phenotype is just the grade uh, of uh, the um, tricuspid uh, regurgitation. Next step is uh, the assessment of uh, the severity uh, of uh, the regurgitation. When uh, we assess the severity of the regurgitation, we look at uh, the color Doppler, uh, we look uh, at uh, the uh, spectral Doppler of, uh, the regurgitant, uh, of the regurgitant flow, we look uh, at uh, the flow in uh, the pulmonary, in the hepatic uh, veins, in order to have a multi-parametric approach as has been suggested by a recent uh, recommendation uh, by the, um, uh, the European Association um, of uh, Cardiovascular Imaging, but uh, those are also uh, paralleled by the um, uh, recommendation issued by uh, the American Society of ECO. And uh, in uh, the assessment of uh, tricuspid regurgitation, the recommendation is to look at the qualitative, uh, particularly the characteristics of the jet color and the density of the continuous uh, uh, wave spectrum, semi-quantitative parameters like the PISA radius, uh, the uh, diameter of the vena contracta, the um, spectrum of uh, the hepatic vein flow, and uh, finally quantitative parameters like the effective regurgitant orifice area, the regurgitant volume, and the regurgitant fraction. Uh, the multi-parametric uh, approach is uh, a very useful, rec uh, heavily recommended, but the problem comes uh, when uh, not all uh, the parameters uh, are uh, concordant uh, in uh, saying this is uh, mild, this is moderate, or this is uh, severe. And then uh, there is uh, no indication of uh, which one we uh, should uh, uh, privilege. And unfortunately, the fact that there are discordancy be, uh, among those parameters is uh, the uh, um, rule more than exception in uh, the uh, clinical practice in the Ecolab. 
One of the points that uh, uh, we have learned about uh, some time is um, forgotten by the Diego cartographer is that the jet, the color jet area is not uh, um, uh, a function of the regurgitant volume, but it's mostly a, a function of the momentum of the jet. And the momentum of the jet depends very much on uh, the velocity of the jet. And uh, this may be a problem because uh, we are used uh, uh, to uh, judge the severity of uh, mitral regurgitation. And uh, we have been uh, trained uh, for uh, many, many years uh, in uh, identifying mild, moderate, severe. If uh, this is questionable on uh, the mitral valve, but it is um, uh, routine, then uh, using the same criteria that we have used for the mitral valve for the tricuspid valve, this is really wrong because as usual, the jet velocity on the right side of the heart is much lower, almost half of the one of the left side. So for the same amount of the color jet, the regurgitant volume is four times larger than on the left. So this is why uh, we have a constant underestimation of the severity of tricuspid regurgitation when you use just qualitative data. However, uh, we have also tried uh, to uh, understand uh, how to manage uh, this uh, situation. And um, so um, by uh, statistical analysis, uh, we have uh, selected six uh, uh, parameters from those who are recommended by current guidelines, and namely the jet area to assess the severity, jet area uh, larger than 10 centimeters square, the ratio between the jet and the right radial, uh, right arterial area uh, more than 50%, effective regurgitant orifice area more than 0.4 centimeters square, regurgitant volume larger than 45 milliliters, uh, regurgitant fraction uh, larger than 50%, and the vena contracta width more than 7 millimeters. And uh, to each one of these uh, criteria for severe tricuspid regurgitation, we uh, assigned the, the uh, score of one, and then uh, selected three group of patients, um, group zero with uh, um, none or uh, uh, a maximum um, of one of these parameters uh, uh, present, group one with the two or four of the parameters that are positive, and the group two when more than four of the parameters uh, are positive. And what, um, and we have tested this type of classifying the patient in more than 500 patients with a severity of tricuspid regurgitation ranging from mild to severe. And look at the, at the composite endpoint of all cause death and heart failure hospitalization at a follow up of a medium of 18 months. And uh, this is quite a busy slide, but uh, all I wanted to say that uh, all parameters of the cuspid regurgitation severity, as well as uh, those looking at the function of the right ventricle, indeed were different between the patients who didn't experience the uh, event that uh, were um, the um, 145 and uh, those patients who experience uh, those events. And then uh, um, the Kaplan-Meier curse that showed that as expected that uh, uh, the group two with the more than four positive uh, criteria has a much worse uh, outcome that the group one and uh, with uh, two, four positive criteria or the group zero with uh, less. But what was interesting that when we performed a um, multivariable analysis, we found that only the quantitative parameters uh, um, 
um, uh, of uh, tricuspid regurgitation severity, and uh, particularly the regurgitant volume, the effective regurgitant orifice area, and the, the regurgitant fraction were independently associated with uh, the outcome. But uh, all uh, the uh, semi-quantitative and uh, qualitative parameters uh, did not. And uh, this uh, was uh, a strong point to recommend uh, uh, to uh, quantitate uh, the uh, extent of uh, the severity of the tricuspid regurgitation. And uh, this was also uh, the experience we have uh, a few years ago. Denise Muraro uh, was able to uh, show that um, measuring uh, uh, the severity of tricuspid regurgitation, whatever is the parameter that uh, you choose, you can uh, separate uh, your patients, uh, not only in patients who would have event, but patients who are at a low intermediate or high risk of event. So stratifying also the risk of hospitalization for right heart failure and uh, the uh, risk of hospitalization plus death. However, how to quantitate? Because uh, using the conventional PISA method uh, can be quite uh, <coughs> challenging uh, um, in a patient with a cuspid regurgitation because uh, most of the assumptions uh, that are uh, uh, at the base of the PISA method so that uh, the orifice is uh, very small and perfectly circular and it lays on a flat plane and uh, then uh, the proximal iso uh, velocity surface uh, um, surface is a perfect hemisphere and so you uh, measuring a radius are able to calculate uh, the surface is uh, almost never uh, respected uh, the valve is a tree leaflet, and when uh, the commissure opens, uh, it's quite unlikely that uh, there is uh, a uh, uh, rounded orifice. Uh, the orifice may be stellar in most of the cases, may be elliptical, may be um, uh, um, as a, a slide. Uh, crescentic, but it's uh, never rounded. And usually the tricuspid regurgitation, regurgitant orifice in a patient with moderate, severe, or more than severe uh, diseases is quite large. Then there is always a certain degree of tenting of the leaflet, even in the atrial phenotype. And so there is an angle made by the leaflet and the orifice is not laying anymore on a flat plane. And then finally, the low um, uh, driving pressure through the orifice makes uh, that uh, the PISA is not uh, an hemisphere, but is uh, flattened and it becomes more like uh, a pie, a donut, or whatever you like, but it's never rounded. And so it's really unlikely that from a single uh, um, uh, radius, you can calculate the surface. So what uh, we did uh, is uh, to take into account these peculiarities of the tricuspid valve in uh, correcting uh, the uh, normal uh, PISA, the conventional uh, PISA formula by the low velocity through the valve and also by the uh, angle uh, of uh, the leaflet. This uh, approach that was uh, already proposed uh, by uh, Rivera uh, many years ago, but then it was uh, forgotten, but now has become really, really uh, important. And uh, using uh, this uh, method, we were able to reclassify a, a, a sizable number of uh, patients uh, and uh, quite interesting as you see from this graph is uh, particularly in uh, the group of uh, the moderate, severe or more than severe that you can uh, reclassify all those patients uh, when uh, you take uh, into uh, account the geometrical factors. And uh, this occurs in around 37% of uh, our patients with the secondary tricuspid uh, regurgitation. The last part of the ECHO exam will, uh, is uh, dedicated to the assessment uh, of the hemodynamics and functional impact uh, on the right ventricle and uh, the right uh, atrium. 
uh, we all know that uh, the right ventricular function uh, uh, is uh, a key determinant of the outcome uh, of uh, patients uh, with the tricuspid regurgitation. This is one of uh, these are a couple of uh, the papers uh, that have shown that this uh, is uh, by Mari Dietz showing that the patient with the increasing uh, degrees of uh, right ventricular dysfunction and uh, occurring also the appearance of uh, symptoms that the patients have worse and worse uh, outcome. Um, going back uh, a little bit uh, to the uh, physiology of uh, the, uh, uh, the right heart during tricuspid regurgitation, uh, there is uh, this um, um, volume overload that uh, over the right ventricle that, ch that changes the pressure volume loops, and uh, particularly in uh, um, moving the um, uh, the, the loop is increasing in size, is moving towards uh, uh, the right, and also the slope of the contractility decreases uh, with a, a progressive uh, dysfunction. One of the um, um, problems is that in many of the patients with tricuspid regurgitation, we do not only have the volume overload, but that there is also pulmonary hypertension that may be post-capillary in most of the cases because of diseases of the left heart, but in some cases is also pre-capillary. So we have to take into account of two um, uh, overload conditions affecting the function of the uh, right ventricle. So we look at the, uh, first uh, at uh, correcting for the volume overload uh, in uh, tricuspid regurgitation patients uh, by developing uh, the concept of uh, effective uh, um, uh, right ventricular ejection fraction. That means uh, um, the subtraction from the total stroke volume of the right ventricle, the regurgitant volume. And so uh, take into account only the amount of uh, blood that effect effectively is ejected by the right ventricle in the, the lung circulation compared to the total uh, right ventricular and the diastolic volume. Those are data collected by the one of uh, our researchers that now has been just uh, submitted. And uh, using the spline curve, uh, we found uh, that uh, the um, uh, threshold value of these ejecti um, um, uh, um, effective right ventricular ejection fraction that uh, um, start where start the outcome to uh, be worse and worse is at the amount of twenty percent, and when. <laughs> Looking at the kaplan mayer curves of patients with um, tricuspid regurgitation uh, stratified uh, according to the effective right ejection fraction, higher or lower on 20%, you see this uh, uh, striking difference in outcome of uh, those patients with uh, large divergent curves starting very early during uh, follow-up compared to the conventional indexes of right ventricular function, like the right ventricular ejection fraction and the right ventricular free wall longitudinal strain, the uh, effective right ventricular ejection fraction has a significantly larger uh, area under the curve. And uh, um, we have found that uh, putting together the um, data of the right ventricular ejection fraction and the right ventricular effective ejection fraction is a, a good way of separating our patient. In yellow are patients with uh, the right, normal right ventricular ejection fraction, so more than 45% and uh, uh, higher than 20% of effective regurgitant ejection fraction. In red, we have patients with the normal right ventricular ejection fraction, but effective ejection fraction less than 20%. 
In green, we have a patient with a, a decreased uh, right ventricular ejection fraction, less than 45%, but the preserved uh, effective ejection fraction. And uh, finally, in blue, we have a patient with uh, um, uh, decreased both uh, the uh, global uh, right ventricular ejection fraction and uh, the effective ejection fraction. And uh, uh, as you can see, uh, even in patients uh, in uh, no with the normal global ejection fraction, uh, the red curves, uh, but with uh, a reduced effective ejection fraction, have uh, a significantly worse uh, outcome than a patient with the global right ventricular ejection fraction that is decreased, but as uh, uh, higher than twenty percent the effective ejection fraction. But of course, then we have also to uh, correct for the increased uh, afterload. And uh, a way to do that uh, is uh, to uh, measure the right ventricular pulmonary artery coupling that uh, is uh, done in uh, physiology uh, with the ratio between the elastance of the ventricle and the elastance of the pulmonary artery. Uh, there have been uh, several surrogates uh, of uh, the right ventricular PR coupling that have been proposed in uh, echocardiography also for the, for the tricuspid valve, while the uh, TAPS divided by PASP, the fractional area change divided by the pulmonary artery, um, uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressure, but none of them uh, really works. Uh, TAPSE as velocity in uh, the uh, right ventricular longitudinal strain take into account only the longitudinal function of the right, the right ventricle, but only of this uh, very thin slice of the tomographic uh, view that we take in the, the apical uh, portion. Right ventricular ejection fraction and fractional area change uh, uh, overestimate the actual right ventricular contractility because uh, of uh, the volume over rope. But the most, the most important limitation is uh, that uh, the inaccuracy of the Doppler estimate of the pulmonary artery systolic pressure in a patient with a severe um, tricuspid regurgitation. This has been demonstrated elegantly uh, several years ago by Philip Lurz and uh, co-workers in a simultaneous uh, echo and uh, cut studies showing that in a patient with a severe tricuspid regurgitation, the um, correlation between uh, um, the um, echo estimate and uh, the uh, cut measure pulmonary pressure was uh, uh, definitely poor, poor and not uh, usable in the clinical routine, sorry. Recently, Lamarchand and uh, co-workers have uh, shown that uh, the main problem here is uh, the estimation of the pulmonary pressure. Uh, the severe, in a patient with the severe tricuspid regurgitation, there is a rapid equalization of uh, the pressures uh, between uh, the um, ventricle and uh, the atrium, and there is also a very dynamic uh, change of uh, the pressure in uh, the uh, atrium that is uh, quite unlikely that uh, we can uh, take a, a single um, an accurate a single measure just looking at the size of uh, the uh, vena cava and uh, the change with the, the respiration. So we had uh, to uh, find another way of uh, looking at uh, the coupling uh, between the ventricle and uh, the pulmonary artery. And uh, we uh, went back uh, to the original uh, formula and uh, developing this formula, we realized that can be done in a single beat, uh, just as the ratio of uh, the stroke volume over the end systolic volume. This has been uh, um, uh, validated mainly in a patient with uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, has never been done in patients with a tricuspid regurgitation. So we went back to uh, in the echo lab and uh, to we developed the, the concept of uh, um, putting together the effective uh, stroke volume. So the forward stroke volume divided by the, the end systolic volume. 
And uh, this is a way of uh, uh, measuring uh, the RV-PR coupling without uh, taking into account uh, the uh, pulmonary pressure. We have just uh, to measure the volumes uh, of uh, the right ventricle with the three-dimensional echocardiography, then the regurgitant volume with uh, the corrected PISA uh, method uh, described before, then uh, we subtract from uh, the total stroke volume, the regurgitant volume to obtain the right ventricle forward, and then divided by the end systolic volume. This has been published just last month on the Journal American Society of Echocardiography, showing that among the uh, various uh, uh, parameters or surrogates of um, RVPR coupling that have been used in the past um, uh, by ECHO, uh, the method with uh, the forward stroke volume divided by the end systolic volume as a, a significantly larger, larger uh, um, under area under the curve. And also he was able to separate the patients with uh, um, uh, worse or better outcome evaluated as uh, all cause death uh, or uh, rehospitalization for heart failure. And uh, when uh, we look at the, at the added value of this uh, parameter, uh, as you can see here, either in a model with uh, uh, several uh, basal model with several clinical uh, and uh, quantitative uh, echo parameters like uh, STR severity, right atrial volume, and diastolic and then the, and the free wall longitudinal strain. If you add uh, the TAPS and PAPS as a measure of uh, um, coupling, then on uh, this uh, model with the TAPS and PAPS, if you, if you add uh, uh, our uh, uh, index of RVVPR, you have a significant um, increase in a prediction of outcome. And the same occurs when you use the right ventricle free wall longitudinal strain over PASP uh, uh, index. Um, however, right, the right ventricular function is important not only in a patient with a severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation, but uh, there is uh, this recent uh, data that uh, we have uh, uh, developed and uh, are now uh, being uh, submitted again. Then uh, we look at, at um, uh, the outcome and uh, the severity in terms of uh, effective regurgitant orifice area associated with the outcome. And using the spleen curve, we have seen uh, that uh, more than 0.4 that define the severity of a tricuspid regurgitation is 0.47 that really uh, is at the threshold showing patients who have a worse outcome uh, in the future. And uh, as you can also see here with the kaplan Meyer. But then we look at those patients looking at uh, being interesting, uh, interested, but what happens in a patient with less than, uh, um, with an effective regurgitant orifice area, less than 0 0.047. And as you see here, in, uh, uh, if you stratify patients by the uh, size of uh, the uh, right uh, uh, ventricle and the diastolic volume enlarged or normal, uh, taking 90 milliliters meter square as a cutoff. So uh, uh, normal, uh, the yellow li line and uh, the um, uh, enlarged, uh, the red one, or end systolic volume uh, index of the right ventricle, again, uh, yellow, normal, uh, red, enlarged or looking at the right ventricular ejection fraction, normal, uh, higher than 45% or lower, uh, uh, yellow and red, and uh, finally, uh, our uh, the coupling that I described before. And you see that uh, taking any one of those parameters of right ventricular geometry and function, but even the patients with uh, uh, effective regurgitant orifice area less than 0.47 that would have been classified as a low risk uh, tricuspid regurgitation. But if they have associated one of those indexes of right ventricular remodeling, their uh, outcome is uh, close to the, those patients with uh, effective regurgitant orifice area higher than 0 0.47, that is the green uh, line. 
The last two slides uh, to the right, uh, HR uh, size and function. This is the most neglected uh, um, uh, cardiac chamber, particularly in patients with tricuspid regurgitation, but it's important. When uh, the right atrium is enlarged or the right atrium is dysfunctioning, and I'm talking about a longitudinal strain during the reservoir uh, phase, this affects uh, the outcomes of uh, uh, our patients. And uh, this is uh, particularly uh, important if you look at uh, the uh, prediction of outcome, a baseline model with the NIA class severity of tricuspid regurgitation and uh, size of uh, the right ventricle. Then we had the TAPSI as a, a index of function of the right ventricle. We have an increase of uh, the prediction model a further a small increase when you uh, put the right ventricle free wall strain, but uh, you have a, a significant increase when at this model that already takes into account the size and the function of the right ventricle is included, the size and the function of the right atrium. So just to conclude this uh, um, longer talk about what we have learned about the tricuspid regurgitation, um, and the few points that they wanted to make that 3D echocardiography has made instrumental uh, to better understand the pathophysiology and uh, the um, uh, severity and uh, the remodeling of the chambers uh, in patients with tricuspid regurgitation. And uh, those data are uh, key to phenotype the patients, assess their prognosis and uh, their suitability for intervention. Uh, we have to remember that the tricuspid valve is not just the right uh, uh, sister of uh, the mitral valve, but uh, it's, uh, it's a different anatomy and working in a different hemodynamic uh, environment, and so needs a dedicated echo Doppler approach. And then uh, um, the right uh, ventricular and the right atrial size and function are also key in assessing the prognosis uh, of our patients with hemodynamically significant tricuspid caspian regurgitation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Badano. That was a, an amazing lecture. Uh, so we'll go to the Q&A now. If you have any questions, please place them in the, in the Q&A and we'll go through them. Dr. Garcia, if you would like to start with the first question. Well, I have to um, really uh, 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 tell you how, how impressed uh, we are with um, certainly your career and your dedication to to a topic that is, uh, to many of us, uh, relatively obscure, but but clearly you demonstrated how important it is, and and you have really gone from uh, one extreme to the other. I was at the beginning a little bit perplexed when you showed the stepwise approach in your four elements uh, that you, you did not include assessment of pulmonary pressure there as a number five. Obviously, at the end you explain very clearly uh, why, and is that certainly we can't do it um, non-invasively. Um, now, if I interpret correctly uh, your last few slides, um, your data suggests that if uh, abnormal RV uh, PA coupling is equivalent to increased afterload, um, and if you have abnormal RV PA coupling, even if you have lesser degree of tricuspid regurgitation, your prognosis is poor. Ergo, I would conclude that maybe in these patients it's not worthwhile to pursue repair of a tricuspid valve, even if the regurgitation is severe because their um, prognosis is already impaired regardless. Am I going too far with that? No, you are not. Uh, the problem, uh, at least in our environment, uh, that usually those patients are referred uh, too late uh, when uh, there is uh, an uh, impairment not only of the right ventricle, but also of the peripheral organs uh, like, like the kidney and the liver. I think we have uh, to try uh, to change these uh, in uh, picking up uh, those patients at the earlier stages where they can benefit uh, uh, also from uh, the conventional surgery because uh, if uh, the patients are not uh, um, impaired in their liver or uh, kidney function, they will have a much better benefit of, from uh, a uh, 
surgical uh, annuloplasty of that the tricuspid valve. Thank you very much. Uh, so one question on the on the RA you, you showed at the end, and I, I liked it a lot of the the differences that the RA can have an influence on on, on TR. We know the different prognostic things we can measure with with uh, with echo uh, for for tricuspid regurgitation. According to the RA size, should we, when the right atrium is very dilated or not so dilated, should we prioritize some markers as prognosis versus other markers? Does it have an influence on the predictability? Well, the data about the right atrium are just accumulating. Uh, in during the last two months, uh, uh, three papers uh, independently assessed the, the value of the right atrium in patients with the tricuspid regurgitation. Um, I think that uh, uh, in uh, patients uh, who have uh, a severe tricuspid regurgitation, still preserved uh, right ventricular function and so on, but if they have a, a severely dilated uh, right atrium that is larger than 48 milliliters meter squared and an impaired, uh, a, a significantly impaired function that it is that less than 14% on the longitudinal strain, those patients at least uh, would need a closer follow-up because they are starting to go down on their uh, uh, deterioration of the hemodynamic situation. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a, one question from, from our fellows. Thank you so much, Dr. Badano, for this great lecture. I have a question. They say it seems that if severe TR is left untreated, RV will dilate and become dysfunction dysfunctional, such as adverse RV remodeling. I, I wonder if the uh, device-induced TR is left untreated. Once the RV and tricuspid valve annulus become dilated, the original TR mechanism, in this case, device lead impeachment, may be difficult to diagnose in these late stages. Um, uh, well, uh, let me say that it's not that difficult to diagnose uh, because you still see clearly the interference uh, of the electric wire with the uh, leaflets or the adherence or the perforation or, or whatever it is. Then it becomes difficult to treat because uh, um, on, uh, on top of uh, the mechanical damage uh, to the leaflet uh, given by the wire, there is uh, also the, the dilation of uh, the annulus uh, that starts uh, a mechanical vicious cycle uh, to become uh, uh, severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation that becomes uh, more and uh, more severe. Um, I didn't uh, made uh, I didn't enter uh, for uh, the sake of time into the detail of the CAD related uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation, but uh, we have to remember that not all uh, CAD related tricuspid regurgitation are due to the interference, uh, direct interference of uh, the wires with the, the leaflets, uh, but there is also the dysfunction uh, um, created uh, by the device uh, by itself that can create a secondary tricuspid regurgitation even without the interference uh, of uh, uh, the wire just because of uh, the uh, dysfunction uh, of uh, the right ventricle. So this, again, is, a, is an evolving uh, field and um, uh, there is a... A review paper that will uh, be published soon in the European Art Journal that will uh, will try to make uh, a status of a current knowledge about uh, this, but it is increasingly uh, appreciated also by the electrophysiology community. Thank you very much. I think just as a last question, if you don't have any any more, you didn't comment on the pulmonary artery pulsatility index. What's the value as compared to coupling or when should we use it? Uh, thank you. This is a very uh, good question. I didn't uh, uh, comment because I didn't have uh, any uh, direct uh, experiences. So I cannot, uh, we have, uh, <laughs> sorry, not used it uh, so far, but for sure uh, this uh, is something that can be added into our armamentarium to better understand uh, the pathophysiology and assess the severity of the disease. 
Thank you very much. Well, this was a great lecture. I think uh, we all have a lot of ideas on future projects and, and hopefully we can find some of those together and, and, and work in collaboration. Yeah. We will stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.